Hi, everybody, and welcome to the session. Um, I can see people still trickling in. So I think we're going to give maybe just two more minutes as people find the links uh, in their emails to get onto Zoom uh, before we get started. But just to say welcome to the session. Thanks for coming along today. I say that on behalf of Rethinking Economics International and Economists for Future International. And um, yeah, sit tight for a few minutes and we're just going to let um, uh, people continue to join the session. So I, I can still see people trickling in, but I think we're going to get started. So we've got enough time uh, to hear from Simon and also to kind of have a bit of a discussion and, 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 and some, some questions at the end of the session. But yeah, welcome to the this session. Uh, rethinking the economics of climate change five times faster. Uh, rethinking economics international and economists for future uh, in conversation with the author Simon Sharp who's been a, a, a long-time friend and ally of Rethinking Economics, uh, probably in the UK. And uh, we're really excited to get our hands on this book, read this book, and also start discussing this book. And um, because, um, as Bits say, it comes at a, a timely point. Timely maybe sounds too positive. You know, we, we, we've heard the news this week of the release of the IPCC synthesis report, which makes clear um, we maybe have the resources and the knowledge, or maybe maybe Simon's going to talk and dispute that a little bit. We have the the a uh, lots of the things in place um, to tackle the devastating impacts of climate change and da dangerous climate change, um, but we we maybe lack the political will or the correct thinking, correct application of policy, in order to make that change. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to um, uh, welcome this really timely book on the topic. Um, Simon Sharp uh, is Director of Economics for the UNFCCC Climate Champions and is a Senior Fellow at the World Resources Institute and in the past was the Deputy Director of the UK Government's COP26 unit. So it's kind of been on the front line um, on, a num on a number of different um, fronts, be it uh, uh, international organizations, national governments, kind of seeing the role that diplomacy, economics, uh, scientific thinking uh, is playing or, 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 or as we'll see maybe being ineffectively applied um, on this question of how we um, arrest the uh, increasing temperatures and inhospitability, inhospi on inhospitability of the plant that we live on. Um, that's, I think, probably enough for me by way of introduction. Uh, my name's Ross, so I should have said from Rethinking Economics International, and I'll be facilitating the session. Uh, Sonal, uh, who's the uh, other uh, panelist on the screen uh, with her screen off, um, is running tech support. So if you've got any questions or problems or issues, uh, please direct them to her. Um, but I think it's probably the best time to hand over uh, to Simon uh, yourself. Thank you so much, Simon, for coming along today. Okay, thanks, Ross. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Really great to be with you. Um, as as Ross mentioned, I'm a big fan of rethinking economics. I I think it's an absolutely inspiring movement. So huge appreciation for everything you do. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the the economics part of my book, uh, which feels appropriate for today. 
Um, let's just check I've got these. Yep, I can move through. So the book's called Five Times Faster because we have to decarbonize the global economy five times faster this decade than we have done over the last two decades. That's in terms of annual rate of change in the emissions intensity of the global economy. So that's an absolutely huge acceleration. And surely we can't move that much faster if we keep doing everything the way we're doing it and thinking of it the way we're thinking of it. So what needs to change? I, I have a metaphor, which is to do with the infrastructure of climate change. You think of a city, you see the stuff that is above ground, but there's a load of stuff you can't see that is actually determining determining how everything works. The, the things like the electricity cables, the sewage pipes, the oil and gas pipelines, all of that infrastructure. And what I'm saying is it's a bit similar with climate change. It's not just the visible infrastructure that we've got to change, the coal plants and you know the gas boilers and the petrol cars and all of that stuff. It's also the invisible infrastructure of ideas and institutions. That also needs changing if we're going to move five times faster. And in economics, the starting point for all of this is the idea of equilibrium. And uh, I was actually at a discussion last week at the Bank of England with uh, Alan Kerman, who used to be one of the world's most famous general equilibrium theorists. Uh, no longer that because he moved away from that idea. And also Joe Stiglitz, who's another Nobel Prize win winning economist. And the two of them actually agreed that the main thing wrong with economics today is that it's got too stuck on the idea of equilibrium, the situation in which nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions so that the status quo can continue at least temporarily. Now, what I want to contrast that with is the situation facing us in relation to climate change and what we have to do about it. This is what the IPCC says, that meeting climate goals requires rapid and far-reaching system transitions, unprecedented in terms of scale. So what does a system transition mean? How does that compare to that definition of equilibrium? Well, you could call it a situation in which many actors have many reasons to change their actions so that the status quo is replaced with something completely different. In other words, it, it couldn't be further away from the idea of equ equilibrium. It's a completely different context. So this, this change of that fundamental assumption really changes everything. It changes what do we think the economy is like? Do we think it's like a machine which is static, predictable, and either functions or fails? That's, that's very consistent with thinking of the economy in equilibrium. Or do we think of it more like an ecosystem, which is constantly evolving, uncertain, and for practical purposes, unlimited in its future possibilities? And it really can't function or, or fail. That's a sort of meaningless concept in relation to an ecosystem. Now, I'd argue that, that the ecosystem view is more appropriate in most cases for thinking about the economy, but definitely in a case where what we're trying to bring about is huge structural change, system transitions, and innovation over time. Um, it also affects this question of what it is we think we're trying to do. Now, if we think the economy is fixed and static, then there's only really one challenge for economics, which is the allocation of those existing resources. But if we think it's changing over time, then allocation of existing resources is only one problem. A different kind of problem is how do you create resources in the first place and how do you change the structure of the economy over time to move in the direction you want to move? And, you know, Brian Arthur, who's, who's a great complexity economist, has said that these two ways of thinking about economics go right back to the very beginning when uh, Xenophon, the Greek philosopher, wrote his book that gave the name to the field of economics. He talked about these two problems, and many economists have done since. But for the last 150 years or so, the mainstream of the discipline has got a bit stuck on the problem of allocation, primarily because it wanted to solve equations. And to do that, it had to assume equilibrium. And that implies a fixed, static, predictable economy. But our problem with climate change is clearly the other kind. It's a problem of creation and change, a problem 
not of allocative efficiency, but of dynamic efficiency. How do we change things quickly and effectively in the direction that we want to go? Now, that difference has implications for what I would say are the three main levers of policy. Um, you can think of most policy as falling into one of these categories. It's either spending money, investment, taking money away, tax, or changing the rules of the game, regulation. Um, and strategy is a combination of all of these things and a question of what direction you're trying to go. So I'll briefly go through implications in each of those areas. First of all, investment, and uh, another way of describing that or a subset of investment is subsidy. Now, typically, economists have said that subsidizing clean technologies is inefficient and a much better thing to do would be simply to price carbon. But look at what essentially happened. This on the right, this is a quote from Stefan Halligat, who's a senior economist at the World Bank and his colleague, Julie Rosenberg. And they've said that today, renewable energy is cheaper than coal in many places in the world. Car manufacturers working on electric cars, cities switching to electric buses. All of this was achieved with policies focused on new investments not with carbon taxes. And look at what has been achieved, actually much more than people expected. Back in 2005, governments and the IEA and other analysts, they were all predicting that solar photovoltaics would be deployed at about a level of 50 gigawatts globally by 2020. And look at what actually happened. We have more than 700 gigawatts by that time. So more by an order of magnitude. Now, why did that happen? How do we do so much better than we expected through a different policy from the one that was expected? Well, I think it has everything to do with feedbacks. When you invest in new technologies, you directly strengthen the, the reinforcing feedbacks, the ones that give you increasing returns to scale. Learning by doing, the more we make something, the better we get at making it, the more it improves. Economies of scale, the more we produce, the more the costs come down. Complementary technologies means the more a, a particular core technology uh, is used, then the more other technologies emerge that make it more useful. And then you've got this, this larger feedback between increasing investment, increasing innovation, and increasing demand, which then increases investment again. These are all the things you get when you invest directly in the new technology or the new system. When all you do is put a small price, a, a tax on the old system, the incumbent, which is already very powerful and taking up most of the market, all you do is, is nudge that incumbent system to operate slightly more efficiently. You don't bring about system change. You're highly unlikely to. So in fact, that's a dynamically inefficient way to approach this problem. And if you look back at the uh, history of technology transitions, something Frank Heels is known for writing about, then you find that, of course, all of them happened by people investing and innovating in the new system. None of them happened because people just put a bit of pressure on the old system. Um, and you think about the, the transition from horses to cars, you know, it happened because people invested in cars, in engines, in factories, they built the motorways, they wrote the highway code, they did all of these things. It, it didn't happen just because they put a tax on horseshit, even though horseshit was actually quite a big problem in many cities uh, back at, at, at the beginning. So secondly, regulation. Now, regulation probably has an even worse name than subsidy. It's, it's often talked about with nasty adjectives like burdensome and you know inefficient i i think that's unfair because regulation is really just the rules of the game and it, it matters a lot you think about the traffic system we have regulations that say you should drive on the left if you're in the uk some other countries it's drive on the right but we all agree that's a helpful regulation it doesn't make the traffic system less efficient it makes it much more efficient than it would be if we left everybody to decide which side of the road they were going to drive on for themselves. But let's think about it in terms of innovation. This is a study done by uh, Stephen Chu and colleagues. Stephen Chu 
was energy secretary to Barack Obama. And before that, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He wrote something like 500 papers on physics. And this was the first one he wrote on economics. And the reason he did it was he wanted to put high efficiency standards on appliances in America. And he thought that was a good thing to do, not only for reducing emissions, but also for giving people better appliances. But the economists in his department kept doing these impact assessments that said it would raise costs. And he just didn't think that was true. And so he did this study and looked at what actually happened over time when tough efficiency standards were introduced. And he found it didn't raise costs, it did the opposite. It actually accelerated cost decreases, which is obviously a, a very helpful thing. Now, why did that happen? And, and as he said, that was the opposite of what economics traditionally recommend. Uh, expects. Well, I I think of it, it this way that the uh, you can think of the investment or the the flow of finance in a sector like a river, and if there are no constraints, it's a broad river is moving slowly. The finance is slowly moving from the consumers through the producers to the shareholders, the owners of capital, and it's not really being disturbed along the way. It doesn't have to do very much along the way. What regulation can do is change the, the flow of that finance, direct it into a narrower channel where it's forced to move a lot faster. In other words, you say you can't just do whatever you want in this sector. In fact, we're going to force the finance flow to move through a new kind of product. We're saying only a product that meets this standard is now allowed to be sold. So that concentrates the energy. It means the manufacturers can't just uh, milk their current position um, and focus all their resources on uh, exploitation. They have to shift resources to exploration instead to develop something new. Uh, so you can think of that as as the water wheel in the fast moving channel. Nobody puts the water wheel in the, in the big broad river. Another way of explaining that is in evolutionary terms. If we think of the economy as an ecosystem, it makes sense that it follows the the rules of evolution, and the rate of evolution is faster if the population is relatively unfit for its environment. What you do when you change the regulations and you demand higher standards is you're saying to the current population of businesses and products, you're not very fit for the current environment. We've just made you less fit. And if you want to be successful, you will have to evolve faster. And that gets this shift of resources from exploitation to exploration, and you get faster innovation. Thirdly, uh, let's talk about tax. Um, and in many ways, you, you could say this has been the uh, the thing that economists have focused on most in relation to climate change, because they've advocated a, a carbon price as the most efficient means of decarbonization. I've already said that actually, that's not as good as targeted investment in the new systems. But what about if you are using tax, how can you use it in a powerful and effective way. Well, the the traditional advice is that you should levy a, a tax that's equal to the social cost of carbon. In other words, the price of a of the damage of done damage done in climate change terms by a ton of carbon emissions. And uh, you know, some some attempts have been made to estimate that very precisely. On the left, this is from a, a document. 10 years ago now from the US White House Council of Economic Advisors saying that they'd uh, made some technical corrections and rigorous evaluation of costs and benefits. And that had moved their central estimate of the value of the social cost of carbon from $36 a ton to $37 a ton, apparently very precise. But at the same time, what were the scientists saying? The scientists were actually saying without a parameter that essentially represents willingness to pay to avoid human extinction, then social cost of carbon estimates incorporating risk aversion can be unboundedly high. In other words, the social cost of carbon is somewhere between zero and infinity. Now, that's not actually very uh, helpful as a guide to policy. So how can we think about it differently? Well, a better way, I argue, is don't think about the absolute price of carbon, it really doesn't matter. What matters is the relative price of carbon. And that 
matters in a particular sector? How does the clean technology compare to the fossil technology or even one clean technology to another or one fossil to another? And think in particular about tipping points, places where these competing technologies are quite close to each other in their costs, in their competitiveness, and a small extra push in the right place could help one of them gain the advantage over the other one. And even better if that sets off some of those reinforcing feedbacks of innovation and investment and market growth. And actually, we find evidence that tipping points have been at the center of some of the world's fastest transitions so far. Uh, the UK has the world's fastest decarbonization of the power sector. And we, in many ways, we did the same thing as all the other countries. We subsidized solar and wind. We had a few air pollution regulations controlling the dirtiest coal. We had an emissions trading scheme like all of the EU has. There's one thing that was unusual, which was our fixed carbon tax in the power sector of about 18 pounds a ton. And it just happened that this was enough to make coal power more expensive than gas. And so when renewables were growing, taking up a larger share of the market, they squeezed the space for coal and gas. The fossils had to compete amongst themselves over a shrinking piece of the market. And when coal got made more expensive than gas, then that flipped it in the merit order. The coal plants had to wait until the gas plants had generated before the coal plants could come on. And that made them unprofitable. And so many of them were closed down. And you see on the right hand side that that black line, that's the share of coal in uh, UK electricity generation, absolutely plummeted. And that's what's given us such a fast decarbonization. The other example is in road transport, where Norway has by far the fastest transition to electric vehicles in the world. And they've managed it with many measures, a whole package of different policies that reinforce each other. But the one that their own electric vehicle agency says uh, is the main reason why they're so successful is they've used a combination of tax and subsidy to make sure that electric vehicles are cheaper at the point of purchase than the equivalent petrol car. And you can see the effect that has had. So they've activated a tipping point there as well. Now, um, this is a much more hopeful uh, view of the economics of climate change, because what you're looking at here is the traditional view. It's like the Greek myth of Sisyphus, that he keeps trying to push the rock of decarbonization up a hill, but he never really gets any higher. The higher you try and push it, the, the harder it gets, and it always falls back down to where you were before. But if we think of a transition um, in a more realistic way, then we see actually there, there is a top to this hill. That you push the boulder up through this progression of different policies, R&D, public procurement, subsidy regulation, infrastructure investment. And finally, a bit of tax is just enough to push it over the top. And then once you pass this tipping point, you find the new technologies are outcompeting the old in every way, that consumers want them, manufacturers want to make them, investors want to invest in them, and everybody is ditching the old technology. It doesn't mean it's all easy from there on. There are still bumps on the way down, but it doesn't get harder and harder forever. It actually begins to get less difficult. And of course, where you end up is somewhere better than where you started. We're not just moving to a worse economy. I think it's Cameron Hepburn who said, we have economic models looking at climate change they're a bit like if you were standing at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and you had models that told you it was going to be a slightly worse version of the agricultural economy. Uh, that's a bit like the models we have. But of course, that's wrong. We're, we'll be moving to a new economy that's better than the old one, not worse. Uh, final point on this carbon pricing tax and tipping points question is that traditionally it's recommended that the same carbon price should be used all across the economy. And of course, that comes from the logic of allocative efficiency, that if, if you do this, then uh, you know, you'll, you'll find the emissions reductions wherever they can be found most cheaply. But if you think about it in dynamic terms, then you realize that that's uh, a very inefficient way of doing things. But imagine your economy-wide carbon price is just enough to activate a tipping point in road transport, 
you'll be very happy with that. But it will be entirely ineffective for bringing about a transition in the steel industry. And in power and buildings, it may be completely inefficient, grossly inefficient, because you don't actually need anything like that level of carbon price to cross the tipping point in those sectors. In fact, in buildings efficiency, there may not even be a tipping point. There are cost savings to be had, but there are difficulties to be overcome to access those, which are not really uh, to do with relative costs. So we've talked about the three main levers of policy. Uh, the last thing to talk about is strategy. Uh, how do we think about the direction that we're trying to move the economy in? And with the equilibrium view, the economy is, is fixed and it's self-optimizing. It automatically finds the best answer to everything. And if it's doing that, then the principle is that policy should be technology neutral. It shouldn't advantage one thing over anything else. But if we're thinking of the economy as an ecosystem, then we quickly realize that nothing is neutral. No intervention can possibly be neutral. You think of the complexity of an ecosystem with so many different inhabitants. Anything you do to it will advantage some more than others. And the same is true of the economy with all of its different technologies, just like an ecosystem. There's no way you can intervene in it in a way that affects all technologies equally. And we've discovered this in, in the UK as we tried to design technology neutral policies. And at every step, we discovered that's not what they were. They were advantaging some things over another. And, and my pictures here are recalling a point where we realized that the way we'd set up the, uh, the market structure and the competitive subsidy was quite likely to end up with billions of pounds going towards biomass. That's wood that's been uh, come from trees chopped down in North America, shipped across the Atlantic Ocean in dirty fossil fuel burning boats, uh, brought by a truck or train to a power station, and then burned a load of wood chips. And that could be gaining the, the government public investment instead of offshore wind, which is a much uh, cleaner and higher technology form of producing power. And, and we've realized that that doesn't look good. Uh, that's probably not the direction we want to go. Burning wood doesn't feel like the forefront of technology in the 21st century that's going to create jobs and put us in a competitive position in the future clean economy. And so we realized actually this, this neutrality approach has led to us choosing by accident something that we don't want and we need to nudge it in the right direction. And Going for offshore wind has turned out to be a huge success. Cost came down 70% over the course of a decade, and it's now much cheaper than gas power. So the point here is that if you don't choose deliberately and consciously, you will end up choosing accidentally. And typically that will mean uh, favoring whatever is the incumbent or the more mature of the available technologies. Now that that matters even more than its effect at a moment in time because the economy is a complex system. It's path dependent. Just like this graph is of the weather, of a small difference at a moment in time leads to a much larger difference over the course of time. And the economy is the same. That's why our choices now really matter. And one way I think of this is imagine you're you're trying to cross the mountain range of decarbonization. If you choose the, the first easiest next step, uh, that might seem like the logical thing to do. And that's the logic that guides all of these emissions trading schemes, find the least cost means of reducing emissions at this particular moment in time. But there's no reason to think that that is the easiest path through the mountains or the least cost way of achieving a system transition over the course of time. It may be the exact opposite. And not only that, but whatever you do now will lead you to a different place, uh, a different set of technologies and a different shape of the economy in future. So you really, you can't eliminate that uncertainty, but you do have to think very hard about your desired direction. And of course, optimization over time is impossible, not just because of the uncertainty, but because the future range of possibilities doesn't exist yet. 
the future economy is still to be created. There's no optimal path because the path is made by walking. So um, I'm going to stop there so that we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, but if you'd like to find any of the sources underlying the book or the book itself, um, uh, see other events on, on taking other angles on this, all of it's on the book's own website, five times faster.org. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for that. Um, uh, yeah, so we're going to move on to um, a bit of discussion. And I see some people have been using the Q&A section of Zoom, which is great. I'd really encourage you to keep on doing that. Um, and we're going to take a selection of those uh, in just a second. But I'm going to use um, facilitators prerogative um, and, 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 and start uh, open the questions. Um, and maybe ask when, when, when reading the book, one of the things that came across for me was how you argue that climate change cannot be addressed in isolation from other global challenges, poverty, inequality, biodiversity loss. Um, and I was wondering, I guess, as like a, as a, as a community of economists or people that work in the field of economics, what does that branching out look like? And um, how can we go about that? Well, um, that's that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. I, I think I might describe my take slightly differently, which is that um, often when people talk about taking a systems approach to something, then they assume that means uh, imagining a system extremely wide with all possible connections and thinking about all of them at once but actually if you try and do that then it, it leads to paralysis uh you really you no longer have any grip on the situation because it's so broad and so complicated and so i i think one important part of systems thinking is deciding what your system boundary is uh your problem of concern and so when you have these huge problems, it's really useful to break them down. And a lot of um, what I'm arguing for in terms of climate change is thinking much more in terms of the individual sectors, that we spend too long talking about it in economy-wide terms, economy-wide emissions targets over decades and decades. And instead, we should think, what is the natural boundary for a system transition? The natural boundary, I think, is, is around a system of production, consumption, and governance of a certain kind of good or service. In other words, an economic sector, something like the steel sector or road transport or electricity generation. So I, <clears throat> I like you for breaking it down that way. But I think maybe the, the point that you're alluding to uh, is that when you do work with other countries or your own government or anyone you're trying to advocate to, to get these things changed, then you have to start from understanding what their interests are. And typically with most governments in any policy question, reducing emissions comes about fourth on their list of priorities. And there's something to do with jobs, costs and security that tend to come one, two and three. And so I think you have to engage with those interests and make those your starting point. And uh, if you can show how those interests are met, through actions that also help accelerate low carbon transitions, then you're into a zone of high leverage, which is good. Amazing, thanks very much, Simon. Um, so we've got a few uh, questions in the chat and, I, and maybe I'll start off, we'll take them, just because we, we have the benefit of time, uh, we'll take them one at a time, um, but I'd ask you to, um, I think the parlance is, keep it to a, a question rather than a long comment. If you have a, a comment or wanna share thoughts, that'd be great. But please, um, we want to hear um, Simon's reflections and thoughts on what you've got to say. Um, so please, but please do keep on adding questions as we go. And we're going to go to um, Jonah. I think you've put a few questions down. If you want to pick out maybe one of those um, and ask it to Simon, uh, that would be really great. Um, would I can invite you onto the um, panel if you'd like that, or um, yeah, would you like to be invited? If you would you like to raise your hand if you. Um, you invited on. actually i'll just invite you up um great thank you 
Thank you so much also for having me on. I have to leave literally in three minutes. So I probably can't get to hear the answer to my own question. I'll look on the YouTube later. So very sorry for that. Um, very fascinating presentation. What I worry about a little bit is that the non-neutral approach that you're proposing is actually more vulnerable to capture by um, say specific interests, powerful businesses and these kind of aspects compared to um, a, a carbon price that would be sort of a more traditional proposal, which is neutral and you advocate against that. Um, and you show evidence of, of these subsidies and these non-neutral approaches working, but in my view, isn't that just that we didn't put a high enough price on carbon, so we needed these, while if we had a, a good price on carbon, this would be a more effective way to, to get change. Thanks, Jenna. Um, I think I'll, I'll address the, the second part of that first. Uh, so first of all, why would we think that a carbon price is the most effective way to bring about change? There, we, we think that, or you know, many people think that, because of a theoretical argument, theoretical argument that starts from equilibrium, starts from the idea that the economy is a self-optimizing system and that if there's a market failure, you can put a price on something that corrects that market failure and returns it to a state of optimal allocation of economic resources. <clears throat> that's, that's why people think that carbon pricing should be the most effective thing. Uh, there's no evidence for it at all. There's no empirical evidence that suggests it actually is. My I think it's really important to go back to the starting point and say, well, is that theoretical argument in any way plausible? And I've argued, no, it isn't, not at all. It's, it's the wrong way of thinking about the problem. We're not in an equilibrium system. We're not in a self-optimizing system. The problem is not one of allocative efficiency. And so there's no reason actually for us to think that carbon pricing should be the most effective. So that's that's quite a theoretical argument, but I think an important one, because we have to think about where's the burden of proof here? Is the burden of proof on those who argue it is the most efficient policy or the ones who argue it isn't? A, a, a much simpler way of looking at it is just let's assume that all you want to do is make the, the clean technology cheaper than the fossil fuel technology. Imagine the clean technology takes up 5% of the market. You can either subsidize that 5% or you can tax the other 95%. And you're trying to bring about the same difference in relative costs. So it's it's you can expend much fewer resources, you transfer much fewer resources in the economy if you're subsidizing the 5% compared to taxing the 95%. So I'd argue that that subsidy on the 5% is much more efficient even before you start talking about all the feedbacks. And actually the feedbacks are the most important thing. Feedbacks are what bring about change in complex systems. And if you wanna bring about a technology transition, you should really focus on creating the reinforcing feedbacks that help the growth of the new system that you want to bring into being. So for, I think that the theory, the empirical evidence and the dynamic models all support the idea that actually carbon pricing is a relatively inefficient approach to solving this problem. Um, on the question about capture by vested interests, I suppose, I think the starting point here is you, whatever policy approach you want to take, uh, there will be vested interests lobbying very hard for it. And as I said, a technology neutral approach, one you think is neutral is not really neutral. Uh, implementing a carbon price early in a transition is likely to be ineffective. And so what it's doing in terms of technology preference is giving an advantage to the incumbent technologies. And you will see them lobby for that. You will see oil and gas firms lobby for a carbon price because they know that's not a technology neutral policy. That's a policy that advantages coal and gas if it's in a situation where it's early in the transition and that's not gonna alter the relative competitiveness of different technologies. So uh, the, the core to my argument is that technology neutral neutrality is impossible. Whatever you do, you will be lobbied by special interests. It's better to think clearly about your options 
and to understand how what you're doing affects different technologies than to be mistaken in the belief that you can somehow be neutral. I think I think Jordan, um, we missed the end, but um, I'm sure she'll catch up on uh, the YouTube. Um, I'll next up invite um, Rob. If you want to, if you want to come up on the stage, Rob, feel free to 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 speak it, or I can I can read it out whatever feels best for you. Ah, yeah. Oops, sorry, I've raised my own hand. Um, it's Rob. I've allowed you to speak, Rob. Um, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, hello, Simon. Um, what I was asking was, is um, you mentioned the word better economy. Does that mean an economy that would use more energy, more resources? Um, and we know that from the IPCC reports that things like protecting and maintaining our current habitats is one of the best ways of dealing with climate change. Yeah. Hi, Rob. Thanks. Um, you're right. I, I used a few sort of undefined words, uh, which was mainly because I was trying to get through this quickly and make sure we had time for discussion. Um, one of, I suppose, well, let's just talk about the power sector and compare the new technologies to the old ones. And so we're comparing solar and wind primarily to coal and gas. Uh, you could say they're better, the new ones are better in the sense that they're already cheaper in most places in the world and becoming more so. So it's very likely that in future we'll have cheaper electricity than in the past. Uh, second way they're better is in terms of air pollution. The, the solar and wind don't cause local air pollution, whereas coal and gas do. And a third way you can say they're better, of course, is in relation to emissions. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean these new technologies don't create problems of their own. Uh, perhaps they do. Perhaps they, you know, their extraction causes problems. Uh, so I, I'm not arguing that we, you know, the new new economy or new set of technologies in any sector is perfect and solves all of our problems uh, as as soon as we solve one set of problems we create the next set but if we're focused on getting emissions down very rapidly then uh, we have to understand that and we have to accept it and you know solve all of the problems that we can so that's that's roughly the sense in which i'm saying it's better and of course in some sectors, we are not yet able to see what technologies there will be and in which ways they will combine to be better. In, in some tech sectors, that's still further off. But when you look across the energy and uh, the con energy and industrial sector as a whole, three quarters of global emissions, then there's good work done, for example, by the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking and people at Oxford showing you get savings of in the region of, of 10 trillion dollars by moving to a clean energy system compared to a fossil fuel system so you know i i think there's a reasonable case for saying that's better amazing and then there's a there's a question here from daniel who i think is had to leave the session but the question i can read it out is do you think regulation disproportionately affects smaller companies since their budget for exploration is likely to be much lower? If so, how can regulation be designed to avoid this? Or alternatively, how should these businesses be supported? That's a good question. And I, I'm not sure. I think it depends what kind of regulation it is. So I think that I don't want to certainly not saying all regulation is good or all regulation helps innovation. Some of it is necessary, but a pain in the ass. Uh, you know, regulation about filing tax returns or, you know, there are lots of regulations that do add to the burden and the costs of running a business. And I think it's true to say that those kinds of regulations uh, have a greater drag on small businesses compared to large ones because they can't afford to have a team of people whose job it is to 
figure out how to cut through the regulation efficiently. Um, however, the kind of regulation that I'm talking about that has the potential to incentivize innovation, uh, this is the kind that sets new standards that says in this market, a different thing is going to be required from now on compared to what there was before. And I'm not sure at all that that disadvantages smaller businesses. Uh, it, it disadvantages businesses that have a high degree of inertia. Uh, and in some cases, those could be the larger incumbents, the ones who don't really believe that the market is going to change radically. Whereas often startups are the ones who who really want to come in and and you know they want the market to change rapidly and if they position themselves to benefit from that then they can grow very quickly so i think the the question about regulatory design is is not simple but if you focus on uh regulations that force improvement in the direction you want to go to solve a problem then it I think it will be the innovative businesses, whether large or small, that you benefit, and the lazy ones will be the ones who find it difficult. Amazing, thanks. And I've had a, uh, an anonymous question put forward, um, Simon, that I'll read out, and then uh, Christopher will come to you um, after that. Um, we're not quite at the end, but we're approaching the kind of final uh, 15 minutes of this session so if you've got a burning question in your mind that you'd like to ask please put it on the question Q&A uh, so we know it's there and we'll hopefully have time to come to it. Uh, the question I've got here is during your research for this book what do you feel are some of the new approaches to corporate sustainability that are needed to accelerate progress or where do you see big businesses coming in? Huh, that's interesting well um you know, my background is in government, and so I I mainly see the, these problems from a government perspective. Um, but I I do think that what I've written about has an important implication for corporate sustainability, which is I I would summarize it as saying that businesses should probably think less about their footprint and more about their leverage. And what I mean by that is sometimes you get, well, let me give an example, a university that spends a lot of time thinking about whether it should insulate its buildings better and put solar panels on the roof. Now, because, for example, it's got a net zero commitment and it wants to show how it can achieve that. Now, those are good things. Those are good things for all of us to be doing, but they're not the university's source of leverage. The university's source of leverage is it teaches people and it researches new ideas. Now, how is it going to make that helpful for climate change? How is it going to make sure that all of its courses help produce people with the right kind of skills for the low carbon transition and that its top professors are really engaging their brains on solving the problems that we need to solve? And I think it's similar in the private sector. Um, one of the best examples I think of, of a company that I can think of using its leverage is Volvo. Um, Volvo has, has said it will do two things. One is shift all of its cars to all of its production lines so that it's making electric vehicles instead of petrol cars. And the other, they've realized that they have leverage over the steel sector, that cars are, are one of the biggest consumers of steel. And so they've said they want to buy zero emission steel. And that buying commitment is very powerful. When there are enough of those, eventually it'll be a strong enough incentive for the steel makers to actually invest in near zero emission steel production plants. So I think in, in every sector, the important thing is for country, companies to think about what is their leverage in, in the system that they're part of? What's the thing they can do that they, they're uniquely well positioned to do? And that's more important than thinking about their footprint. Although in many places, there'll of course be overlap between those two things. Thanks very much uh, to whoever submitted that question. And um, I'm now, uh, I'll give uh, Christopher the opportunity to uh, ask their question and then we'll go to Nia before uh, um, 
close in the session. So Christopher, if you'd like to ask your question. Hey Simon, um, that was a great talk, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people in this event um, would agree that like solving or, or slowing the climate crisis is um, probably like the, the most pressing issue facing us today. Um, but I guess that if it's solved correctly and, and in a just way, you can tackle a lot of other issues that um, exist in the world alongside it. Um, from your book, it's clear you have a lot of contact with government and the kind of people who are responsible for solving or tackling these um, kind of collective issues. Um, do you think you see it as like a shared response and that solving climate can help to, to tackle a lot of other issues? Or, or do you think they see it as climate is one thing, health is one thing, housing is one thing, and, and there's like a lack of, of almost joined up thinking that's, um, I, I guess, kind of constantly pushing climate to the back book to solve the things that are more pressing. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Um, I think in I think in many cases there's a recognition that the actions to address climate change can be can help address other problems too. Um, one of the best examples I've seen of this recently uh, was from the US and the work that their government is doing on on this slightly misnamed but still helpful Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I went to a session at uh, the last Climate Change Talks, uh, COP27, uh, where they had quite a few city mayors and uh, NGO people all on a panel talking about how they were working together with each other and with the federal government. And I got the sense they've, they've thought really quite deeply about how to integrate some of the, the measures to grow the markets for clean technologies with social policy and you know like having representatives of community organizations go to homes of people in low-income communities and help them understand how they can get grants from the government uh to do things that will help them have warmer houses and lower energy bills and, and that kind of thing so i think that was a great example um it doesn't always happen of course um but I, I, I think there's widespread recognition of that. Uh, the truth is making policy is, is incredibly difficult anyway. Uh, it's, it's much easier from the outside to criticize it for not happening or not solving lots of problems at once than actually doing it. And part of the reason government moves slowly is every decision affects so many different interests and so many different uh, parts of society that you actually do have to think very carefully before you jump in and, and do something. So uh, I'm not defending the slowness of government. There's also, you know, political lack of guts and all the problems that you'd expect. Um, I suppose the, the reason I think it's so important to change the economics is that sometimes we fail to do the right thing for the wrong reasons, that we think a policy is going to add costs when actually it would reduce costs, or we think it's going to block innovation when actually it would accelerate innovation. And it's such a shame if what's holding us up is a misunderstanding uh, rather than an actual, uh, you know, difference of interests. And then finally, I'll invite um, Neha to the to to ask her question, which is very, yeah, if you'd like. You should now be able to ask the question. Hi, am I audible? Yes. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so my question yes, is, uh, for developing economies who contribute very less as compared to the developed countries, yet they are more vulnerable to climate change. Hence, what kind of extra help is currently being provided to them? And what should be the future incentives that should be put forward? Yeah, thanks, Nina. Um, right, so I think what's the best way of coming at this? The I think the ethical position or the ethical problem is widely recognized uh, that the countries that have done least to cause this problem are the ones that 
are, are being hit by it the hardest. Um, and I, I think all of us in this movement would agree with each other that the level of assistance internationally from the countries that have done the most to create the problem to those who are suffering most from it is deeply inadequate. So I, I think we'd, we'd all agree on that. Um, I don't know how you can change that situation. Um, I think it's extremely difficult to. The political realities uh, are that it's it's difficult in any country to make a case, uh, no matter how well ethically justified, for giving resources to another country. Uh, you see that here in the UK, where we used to be one of the only developed countries that had kept its promise to give 0.7% of gross national income to international development assistance. And then very sadly, we climbed down from that and reduced it. Uh, you see the same thing in China, where people don't, outside China, nobody really understands that there is this debate. But many people in China think that their country is giving away too much money to other countries. Uh, and I, I think it's politically difficult like that in every country. So that's that's a very unsatisfying situation. But one thing I, I do want to say that I think is, you know, a more hopeful way of thinking about it is that um, it, once you conceive of low carbon transitions, not as marginal abatement, not as something that automatically has costs, but as a transition from one set of technologies to another, and very likely to a new set that is better, then it becomes a, an issue of shared opportunity rather than burden sharing. And uh, when I speak to people who are involved in the uh, climate vulnerables group, group of countries that are being hit hardest, um, they tell me that their countries are strongly interested in the economic opportunities of the transition. And they, of course, they want international assistance, but they don't just want that. They also want to innovate and be competitiveness, and they, they want to, you know, be seen that way. So I I think for any country there, there's a lot that, that can be done, um, dis, despite the unsatisfactory overall situation. And I think there's, there's some really interesting work being done on this by academics like Keston Perry, who's based in um, based in the States here yeah, about this question of reparations. But yeah, the, the difficulties are very um, apparent. Uh, one final question I've got, Simon, which is for people that have come to this session and have uh, enjoyed the talk and would like to learn more about how to find your book, uh, when is it kind of ready to, to go on sale and to be published? Uh, when is it being published? Sure, thanks for us. It's uh you, it's already available for pre-order and in fact well no longer pre-order i've been told by friends that their copies have turned up at their houses so it's it's there now um amazon and and everywhere else um and so please yep if if you like the sound of it please get yourself one um and and really the point is to spread the ideas so uh if if you can share the the website is where i put a lot of resources that have inspired the book things that i've found helpful from other people uh so if any of those are helpful for you or if the book itself is helpful then please you know spread the ideas thanks wonderful and thank you so much for coming to the session today my um my final shout out is if you you agree with us that and agree with simon there's a you know chronic lack of debate of uh, engagement in planet emergency from the economics profession um, whether that be teaching research public policy um, and we want to change that and kind of respond to the magnitude of the problem we face please reach out to economists for future who are doing a number of reciting research and campaigning projects uh, under the umbrella of rethinking economics uh, that we'd love you to get involved in and we'll hopefully uh, work uh, to make the shift to a uh, decarbon future five times faster, the speed at which we need it, as Simon has talked about. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, if you know anybody that would have come this morning but couldn't, we're actually going to be doing this session again at 5pm UTC um, to accommodate for 
people that can only make it then, but also for our uh, colleagues and uh, members of the network based in Latin America, principally in America. Um, but otherwise, wish you a very good day and uh, thank you for coming along to this session. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Nice to be with you. Same reason. Bye.